Welcome to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel, where I unravel the veiled tales of cryptic crimes. Today, we're diving into the story of a man who emerged from the challenging streets of Liverpool to ascend as one of the UK's most affluent smugglers, dubbed Target One by Europol. His narrative is a complex web of interactions with corrupt officials, shady detectives, and vast fortunes. Strap in as we explore the life and transgressions of Curtis Warren. Curtis Warren was the middle child, born to Curtis Aloysius Warren, a South American seaman employed by the Norwegian Merchant Navy, and Antonia Chantra, whose father worked in a shipyard. His birth date is May 31, 1963, and he was raised alongside his older brother Ramon and sister Maria in Toxteth, a Liverpool district known for its high levels of unemployment, poverty, and racial strife. Ambitious and eager for wealth, Warren struck a deal in the late 80s with a businessman from Middlesbrough, Brian Charrington, to utilize Charrington's yacht for cocaine smuggling. In September 1991, the duo embarked on their illicit journey, initially heading to France before sailing to Venezuela. There, they secured a pact with the Cali cartel to sneak cocaine into the UK hidden inside steel boxes, which were themselves concealed within lead ingots. Upon the shipment's arrival in the UK, HM Customs and Excise sliced open one ingot only to find it empty. Fooled, they allowed the shipment to proceed only later learning from Dutch authorities about the drug's true hiding spot. By then, Charrington, Warren, and the narcotics were nowhere to be found. A second haul, totaling 307 kilograms, was already en route from South America. When this batch reached the UK in early 1992, Charrington, Warren, and 26 accomplices were apprehended in a major operation led by HM Customs and Excise. In a plot twist that seems lifted from the script of a blockbuster movie, it was unveiled that Charrington had been acting as an informant for the police, specifically for the Northeast Regional Crime Squad. Despite the discovery and objections from his police contacts, Harry Nags and Ian Whedon, HM Customs officials, decided to proceed with their case. However, intervention came from Conservative MP Tim Devlin, who facilitated a meeting resulting in Customs being instructed to drop the charges against Charrington on January 28, 1993, subsequently leading to Warren's exoneration. Legend has it that upon his release, Warren brazenly strolled past the HM Customs agents, boastfully declaring, I'm off to enjoy my 87 million pounds from that first haul, and there's nothing you can do about it. Adding to the scandal, Harry Nags was later seen by HM Customs driving a 70,000 pounds BMW, which had previously belonged to Charrington, raising eyebrows and whispers of police corruption. After these events, Warren returned to Liverpool. However, the city became increasingly hostile for him due to a spate of violent crimes among organized crime groups and the relentless attention from the police after their high-profile case collapsed. Feeling unsafe, Warren decided to leave his hometown behind and set up a new life in mainland Europe. By 1995, Warren had relocated to a luxurious villa in Sassenheim, Netherlands. He invested the proceeds from his massive cocaine operation into a variety of ventures, acquiring casinos in Spain, nightclubs in Turkey, a vineyard in Bulgaria, property in the Gambia, and funneling the remainder into Swiss bank accounts. Despite amassing enough wealth to retire comfortably, Warren chose to remain active in the narcotics trade, a decision echoing the downfall of many in his line of work. His activities continued under the vigilant eyes of law enforcement, who monitored his communications with contacts in the UK. Warren's remarkable photographic memory played a key role in eluding capture, he never referred to his associates by their names, instead using code words, leaving the authorities scrambling to connect the dots. This talent also meant he kept all Swiss bank account details and his vast network of transactions purely in his mind, never needing to write anything down, thus leaving no paper trail for his drug operations. This capability afforded him an unlimited line of credit, with drug cartels from South America and cannabis traffickers across Turkey and Eastern Europe. On October 24, 1996, a decisive raid by the Dutch Brigade Special on Warren's villa and other properties he owned in the Netherlands marked a significant turn in his criminal career. The arrest of Warren and his associates followed the discovery of an enormous cache of illegal goods, ammunition, hand grenades, nearly a thousand CS gas canisters, 400 kilograms of cocaine, 1,500 kilograms of cannabis resin, 60 kilograms of heroin. 50 kilograms of ecstasy, along with 400,000 Dutch guilders and 600,000 US dollars in cash. The total value of this haul was estimated at an astonishing 125 million pounds, 
adding an ironic twist to Warren's saga in 1998. He was listed in the Sunday Times Rich List, not as a notorious drug dealer, but as a property developer, with his fortune purportedly around 40 million pounds. Warren's conviction in the ensuing trial quickly led to his name being struck from the rich list. The prosecution laid bare his elaborate scheme to transport cocaine from South America to Bulgaria, where it would be hidden in shipments of wine from his vineyard, then smuggled onward to the Netherlands and Liverpool in the UK. The authorities ultimately seized illegal merchandise, drugs, and wine, with a combined value exceeding 125 million pounds. Warren received a sentence of 12 years in a maximum security facility for his crimes. Despite extensive forensic accounting efforts, investigators were only able to trace 20 million pounds of Warren's estimated 120 million pound fortune. And even this amount was shielded from legal seizure by Dutch authorities, the British police, or Interpol. Warren, it seemed, remained a man of considerable means behind bars. On the afternoon of September 15, 1999, a violent altercation unfolded in the prison yard involving Warren and a Turkish inmate who was serving a sentence for murder and attempted murder. The Turkish prisoner, hurling insults, approached Warren with the intention to strike him, but missed. A brief scuffle ensued, resulting in the Turkish inmate falling and receiving several kicks to the head from Warren. The confrontation ended with the Turkish man hitting his head on the ground, losing consciousness, and subsequently dying from his injuries in the hospital that day. At his 2001 trial for this incident, Warren claimed self-defense. However, the judge, deeming his use of force excessive, found him guilty of manslaughter and sentenced him to an additional four years, setting his release for 2014. In 2002, continuing their investigation into the Bulgarian vineyard drug shipment, Dutch authorities managed to secure an asset seizure order against Warren further complicating his legal troubles. Though investigators were only able to confiscate 180,000 pounds from Warren, legal maneuvers under the Proceeds of Crime Act allowed them to mandate a repayment of $14 million, or Warren would face an additional five years in prison, pushing his release to 2019. After a series of legal negotiations, Warren consented to pay $8 million to Dutch authorities. Moving to February 2005, Astonishing developments surfaced as Dutch officials accused Warren of orchestrating an international drug trafficking operation from within the confines of his Dutch prison cell. For his safety, he was transferred between six different prisons throughout his trial. Although initially found guilty, Warren managed to win on appeal and was released in June 2007. Yet it seemed trouble was never far behind. In November 2007, Colin Smith, known as Warren's former lieutenant, was fatally shot outside Nell's gym in Speak. In a swift turn of events, merely three weeks after his release from Dutch custody on June 30, 2007, the Serious Organized Crime Agency alerted Jersey police of Warren's arrival at Manchester Airport, where he had purchased a ticket to Jersey in cash. Once in Jersey, Warren was seen with a known associate from Liverpool, now living in Jersey, Taffin Carter. The two were observed driving around in Carter's VW Golf, scouting various spots, including the secluded St. Catherine's breakwater. Given the lucrative potential for drug profits in Jersey, where drugs fetch thrice their street value compared to the UK or France, Jersey police initiated Operation Koala. This operation involved surveillance and wiretaps on multiple fronts, including public phone booths and the residence of Suzanne Skurr, Taffin's girlfriend. Through this surveillance, authorities learned of plans by John Welsh, a friend of Warren, to travel to Amsterdam for a rendezvous with a well-known associate of Warren's, a Moroccan named Mohamed Miazid. Jersey police's intention to place a listening device in John Welsh's rental car, originating from St. Malo, hit a legal roadblock when French and Belgian authorities denied permission, citing violations of the European Convention on Human Rights, ETHR. Despite Jersey police not being a signatory to, yet still bound by the ECHR, they proceeded with the surveillance unlawfully as later critiqued by Judge Sir Richard Tucker, labeling the act as both reprehensible and illegal. The operation saw the collaboration of Dutch police, the serious organized crime agency, SOCA, and Interpol, all of whom monitored the intercepted communications. In a concerted effort, SOCA kept tabs on Warren within Liverpool, while Dutch police surveilled informant Liazard in Amsterdam. Their strategy included tracking calls made from various phone booths piecing together the network of communications. 
It came to light during the trial that Warren managed four mobile phones, three in the UK and one in Jersey, and had made a staggering 1,587 calls over three weeks to Liazard, utilizing both the mobiles and public phones across the Northwest. In 2007, Warren was apprehended in St. Helens, charged with conspiring to smuggle narcotics, following a collaborative operation that spanned Jersey Police, Merseyside Police, SOCA, and law enforcement bodies from Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. Despite his plea of not guilty, which spurred two years of legal wrangling over the bugging's legitimacy, it was decided that sufficient evidence existed from other sources to proceed with the case. Jersey police then offered Warren a plea deal, an eight-year sentence without asset forfeiture, which he declined. The unfolding legal drama highlighted that no drugs had actually been imported, as Warren's Jersey-based associates failed to secure the necessary funds. This case stirred significant local debate. Senator Ben Shenton voiced concerns over the financial burden of Warren's defense on Jersey taxpayers. While Progress Jersey lamented the exhaustive focus of Jersey's drug enforcement resources on Warren alone. Ultimately, Warren was convicted on October 7th for his role in conspiring to smuggle cannabis into Jersey. He received a 13-year prison sentence on December 3rd, 2009, marking yet another chapter in his long history of legal entanglements. Jersey police launched an inquiry into Warren's amassed wealth, aiming to seize profits derived from his narcotics trafficking activities. In November 2013, a monumental £198 million confiscation order was levied against him. Should he fail to comply, Warren faced an additional decade behind bars. By March 27, 2014, reports confirmed Warren had lost his appeal against the order, cementing his continued incarceration. However, the saga of Curtis Warren was far from over. A startling development emerged when it was revealed that a female prison officer had engaged in a romantic relationship with him, exploiting various secluded areas within the prison for their liaisons. In 2020, the officer, identified as Stephanie Smith White, was sentenced to two years in prison for her involvement with Warren. Fast forward to 2022, and Warren was finally released, though not without stringent conditions imposed by the National Crime Agency to curtail any future criminal endeavors. These conditions limited his access to cash, mandated oversight of any bank accounts, and imposed severe restrictions on his travel, internet use, and communication, including email, social media, messaging apps, and communication devices. Yet just over six months after his release on July 5, 2023, Warren found himself under arrest again at the residence of Stephanie Smith-White, yes, the very same prison officer with whom he had previously been involved. It appears that Warren has once again crossed the line, facing charges for nearly 20 violations of his serious crime prevention order conditions. Currently released on bail, his trial is scheduled for August 2024. For many lifelong criminals, time served in prison is merely a pause in their illicit activities, hardly a full stop to their careers in organized crime. And for Curtis Warren, it seems that adhering to a law-abiding path is a commitment he's unwilling to make. Share your thoughts and feedback in the comments section below. If you found my investigative analysis insightful, please be sure to like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon too, so you'll get notified each time I release a new video. I appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, stay curious and keep seeking truth.